uh, they close the door, so that must be that we're uh, going to get started. Uh, I'm Professor Lowy, I'll be the moderator for uh, this session. And the way that we are going to do it is I will announce the, the student and their mentor. The student will come and give their talk uh, of up to 16 minutes. And then after that, there will be a few minutes for questions and answers. And then I'm going to ask the mentor to come and place uh, the honor stole around the student's uh, shoulders. And of course, that's a photo op. And we will take advantage of that. And uh, so I'm, I'm delighted to, to be here. All right, so our first uh, presenter starting things off it is Anthony Sanchez. His mentor is Andrea Morgado. His uh, project is titled UNC33, a microtubule associated protein plays a key role in neuronal autophagy. And I'm delighted to find out what all that means. <laughs> Uh, 
And so a quick overview of what I've just mentioned to just summarize is that uh, R33 is localized to axons and essential for their development. Uh, it plays a critical role in, role in cargo adaptation as well as trafficking, and it's a key role in diversity sorting as a result of that, uh, and especially over Common 104, which will be important in my project. Uh, so just a quick overview of autophagy. Autophagy is essentially the cellular recycling, recycling mechanism that is used to degrade either proteins that are no longer needed or damaged components of the cell, such as organelles or other protein aggregates. Uh, and so that uh, begins by the formation of a double membrane organelle, which engulfs cytoplasmic contents, so things like I mentioned protein aggregates. Uh, and then once that double membrane organelle is formed, that's the autophagosome, which is the immature organelle associated with that process, which then fuses with the lysosome uh, and acidifies to become the autolysosome, which is the mature organelle that actually for degradation of those components so the cell can reuse the basic units of those, uh, those items. Uh, so in neuronal autophagy, there's just one additional element. It functions essentially the same way in the autophagosome. This yellow uh, organelle generates distal to the cell body in this case, and it fuses with the lysosome. It's trapped throughout the cell, and a lot of this trafficking is when the acidification happens, which is, like I mentioned, critical to that degradation. And then the cell body, a lot of mature organelle, is actually performing those functions. So the difference here is that trafficking is an essential mechanism for maturation of this process. And so a quick summary of neuronal autopsy is that it's the primary method of uh, recycling within the cell. It's trafficking is essential to the maturation of autophagic systems and neurons, so that's where our point of war is going to be. And then uh, it's also key in the system of the cell. So when you have issues in autophagy, uh, that's associated also with our degenerative diseases in a lot of cases. Uh, and so our research question then, and our hypothesis is that, uh, is pump 33 involved in the transport of autophagosomes and therefore autophagy in neurons? And then we hypothesize based on the fact that pump 33 is responsible for trafficking of axonal proteins, that pump 33 may also play a role in autophagy flux because of its uh, role in trafficking. So to test this, we use a variety of CLR constraints. We have a control CLR that just has an LG1 marker, which I'll explain. Uh, in just a second, we have a null on 33, which is that N and 407 allele that I mentioned with the LG1 marker. Then we have a hypomorph that is an E204, which uh, basically, when on 404 forms what are called tetramers, so four protein subunits come together to make a functional final product, and this introduces mutation that affects that process. Uh, and then we also have a null on 404 mute because of uh, the, the known role in trafficking for maturation of long uh, So we're interested in how motor protein mutations affect the uh, flux through autophagy. And this is an LG. So this LG1 marker that I mentioned is our tool for measuring the autophagic flux. So what happens is that LG1 is a protein that's critical for the development of that membrane that I mentioned earlier. Um, and so it gets incorporated in that membrane. And the trigger gene that we're using it produces LG1 that's then fused to two units of fluorescent protein. And this cleaver, or this linkage right here, is vulnerable to cleavage by cysteine proteases. So this is the first thing to cleave in the system. And so what happens is that once you have the generation of the autophagosome and fusion of the lysosome, this linker gets cleaved, and you can uh, actually see a difference in the amount of protein between this full construct, because this is around 75 kilo bigger, basically. And we can separate based on size from the individual monofluorescent protein units. And so then we can quantify the ratio of these monofluorescent protein units to the full construct to give an idea of the autophagosome. Uh, so, and then to do this autophagy against starvation, because we already looked at both basal conditions and then conditions that would uh, stimulate autophagy, uh, we had two treatment groups. So we had fed animals that should be basal conditions, and then we went through extraction and separation using sonication of that CS page using means that uh, allow us to perform an Western blotting, and then we compared the amount of this full construct to the individual monofluorescent protein units. And then, like I mentioned, we wanted to Autophagy, so we have the same process but with no food because starvation needs to uh, induce autophagy. So our first set of results show that mutation in HOM33 uh, leading to changes in autophagic flux during starvation specifically. So this is an example of Western law, one of the ones that we ran, and here we have the fed conditions and comparing the uncleaved protein, so this full construct to the cleaved protein. And what you can see is that from the fed condition to the starved condition, there's an increase in the amount of this second band, this monofluorescent protein to the uh, unclean protein here uh, in both our humans. 
So the quantification of that data looks like this. And essentially what this graph is showing is the amount of monophores and protein detected in those bands compared to or divided by the full construct here. And what you see is that in the control animals, there's really no difference between the fed and star conditions, as you might expect, because they're handling that increasing modification flux appropriately. And then in up three, you have monophores and nulls. We see a significant increase in the ratio from the fed and the star conditions. So we have a significant interaction effect here, which is exciting. Uh, so that's showing that up three place the And then we also, this doesn't really show very well, these green dots, these are inside basically what's being put in the brain of the sea elements. And so because that LG1 is marked by fluorescent proteins, we can also use microscopy to actually count the individual organelles in the cell, or the animal. And so those results look something like this. So here we have the fed animals, here we have the starved, and this is for our control, the hypomorph and the null. And these uh, results basically reflect the same idea as the previous results, which one validates the biochemical method, so it shows that that actually means something. Uh, and it also, again, confirms that under start conditions, we're seeing an increase in the number of autophagosomes that are present in cell at any given time compared to the control, which suggests an issue in regulation of autophagy in the clearance of these autophagosomes. Uh, so, a quick summary of what we've talked about so far is that R33 is playing a key role in autophagy regulation. And then, what we then looked at is the R104 community. Remember, I mentioned that trafficking is essential to this process. So uh, we wanted to see what happens when you have issues with motor proteins. And so we have the same idea here, except now we're looking at an R33-0 or an r 104 null Again, with the uncleaved protein, this will construct the individual monofluorescent units. And we see the same increase in the monofluorescent protein units compared to the uncleaved protein uh, in the r 104 nulls that we see in the r 33 nulls. And so quantification of that data looks essentially the same. And so what we found is that r 104 means you know, probably, which is just a fancy way to say they look the same in terms of what we're analyzing uh, the, as the R33 units. Uh, we're at a mention value of 0.051, which is super frustrating for anyone that knows stats and stuff, but we're increasing the sample size now that we're looking at that, uh, and we're expecting to see that as uh, significant because of the trend that we're seeing now. And then we also repeated the microscopy in this case to actually, again, validate the biochemical data and look at uh, individual animals as opposed to a population because when we do the protein extraction, this is on a full population of animals, uh, whereas this is in vivo and this is an individual animal at a time. Uh, and so what we see is the same trend and an increase in the number of autophagosomes under starved conditions for our mutants. So a summary of the findings overall is that on 33 plays a role in autophagy regulation and then on 104 mutants, notably um, neocopy on 33 mutants, which indicates trafficking as a potential causal factor in autophagy regulation which makes sense given the knowledge that trafficking is critical to maturation of autophagosomes. So our conclusion is that uh, on 33 mutant misregulation of autophagy may be a result of a failure to localize on 104 to axons or other proteins that are critical to axon or uh, autophagosomal development. So uh, the trafficking I mentioned is primarily retrograde, which is handled by a protein named dynin, whereas casein commonly er, moves in the opposite direction in territory. So it wouldn't, our first hypothesis was that one point of four was going to lead to a significant um, change in the maturation of these autophagosomes. But what we're thinking now with the results that R33 is critical to the localization of this protein, R33 may be critical to the localization of other proteins as well. They're significant to autophagosome uh, development. So future experiments would be uh, to work with diamutants, like I mentioned. Um, and the reason we haven't done that yet is because our mutants didn't really look like we expected them to when we actually got them. So we're work on your future work on that. Uh, and then also maturation of autophagosomes. So there are ways to look at uh, those two fluorescent protein units. You can change what color they fluoresce, and then you can look at the combined signal of, say, a red and a green protein, which looks yellow in the microscope, and then when it acidifies, that green is quenched, and so you end up with red signals. So you can actually look at, in real time, the change in color as a reflection as the map of the maturation of autophagosomes. So that's another way to actually say that the trafficking is a real causal factor in that, or potentially other. Uh, so, acknowledgments, Dr. Andrea Bogado for being a fantastic mentor for the McNair Scholars Program for funding and support uh, for me, NSF for funding our lab, and then San Jose University for providing lab space in the uh, opportunity for this project. Okay, so we got a few minutes for questions. Uh, pass away. Oh, no, I just knew you were going to answer once, oh. or ask one. <laughs> so, it's obviously going to be a beautiful word. I mean, literally. Um, I don't understand how the model is, how your model is going to results. I don't, am 
not saying it doesn't, but I, I need you to be more specific on how the traffic can be checked leads to the regulation of autophagy. Because what you're, what you're sensing, what you're detecting, right, is more autophagy. You know, you know, the lice forms, the lice forms, the lice forms, the neurons, all of it. So, so I get what you're getting at. And that was what we thought first, is that we should see for the, uh, let me rephrase that. So this is showing an accumulation of water for some of these It's not necessarily showing that flux is increasing that happily because flux should be increasing our controller start as well. Well, you're considering special condition. Right? Yes. But it's a drastic increase in the mutants in the under stress. Under stress, yeah. So in a healthy animal, we expect to see no change in the overall presence of monophorus and protein units because full flux through this pathway should eventually degrade the monophorus and protein units fully because autophagy should break those down as well. So what happens is that basically, uh, I guess I would just start this as like a steady state concentration of monophorus and protein compared to the full construct. And these means what we're thinking is that it's more of a traffic jam rather than an upregulation. So there is an upregulation because of the stress, but our results are presenting this way because of traffic jams in the actual flux through the pathway. So we're saying that that's happening because in neurons, this is required to be trafficked to actually form a fully mature. So the issue in trafficking of these organelles is leading to a failure to mature and then fully degrade the monophorus and protein. Your mutants are sensitive? No, these mutants are not temperature sensitive. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's why we're having a problem with dying mutants, is because they are temperature sensitive. Can you guess if you were to do it, if you'd like to see the big thing that's happening? We'd like to see that if you rescue back to the missing temperature, maybe of the dining units that they might see the inside. Yep. If they rescue it, they can support it. Yeah, yeah, that would be an interesting feature experiment as well. And we were also interested in pharmacological manipulations, so seeing if we could uh, introduce different drugs that actually change the presentation of the schema type of the most good. That, that, that was like a, a next step kind of thing, but this is what we got. Great. So, Same consistent 
results as we use populations. So this is everything from uh, probably including eggs to full adults. So it's interesting that these show the same results as individual life stages because that suggests that there's probably coyotes activity going on between individuals at specific life stages as well as the full uh, population. Right, well, thank you. contributions to the scientific community and society as a whole.